If you're looking to start a small business in your local community, then the Start a Local Small Business podcast is for you. Here, we'll walk you through going from concept to open for business. Here's your coach, Tammy Adams. Hey, future business owners, it's time for another episode of the Start a Local Small Business podcast. Today, I want to continue our conversation on research. Now, in our last episode, we focused on doing the research when it comes to your competition. We discussed that you need to know what their products and services are. What are they charging for them? Not to mention what their reputation is and how they are marketing their business, plus a whole list of other key factors that you will want to know about them. So if you haven't listened to episode six yet, which was part one of our research discussion, I want you to head on over right now and take a listen. So here in part two of our research topic, we are going to dive in into all the other items that you will want to make sure that you research as part of your journey into opening up your new local small business. Now, don't forget, I will have over at the Start a Local Small Business website, a downloadable checklist that you can use. Just click the resources tab or just type in startalocalsmallbusiness.com slash research checklist. Once again, startalocalsmallbusiness.com slash research checklist. And we will have a checklist there that actually will list out all the different items that you will want to be doing as part of your research for your new local small business. As a bridge between our competitors and other types of research, I want to make sure that you are also looking into the trade area that you plan on servicing. If you plan on having a brick and mortar, statistically, your trade area is no more than five miles. Unless you are a destination place that folks will seek out and are willing to drive further, you can count on this four to five mile radius. Really depends upon how your area is laid out, but statistically, that's about what you're looking at. The the exception is going to be in remote areas because remote areas, they will drive much further. Uh, For example, uh, they will drive hours just to spend the day at Walmart. They'll hit all of the big areas areas. When I worked at Home Depot, I used to laugh in our remote areas because people would hitch up the trailer because they go to Walmart and Home Depot and Sam's Club and all those different things at one time. And if you're one of those destination type of businesses, they might do that for you. But in most cases, local small businesses, that's not our thing. So you don't want to count on that because it's going to be very rare that someone's going to come to you outside of your five mile radius. So when determining a location, make sure you are looking at that and how many potential clients or customers you might have. And each business is slightly different. When I had my ice cream shop, it was a great uh, area location because I had all single family homes within that five mile radius. However, if I was surrounded by a bunch of businesses, that would have drastically um, changed my uh, demographic because that's not who my customer was in an ice cream store. Not saying I wouldn't get any business, but I wouldn't have the opportunity to get near as much. You know, for example, if you're a garage door repair person and all you have within the five mile radius are carports, it's not going to be a great location for this type of business. So you definitely want to look at your trade area. You want to look at what your competition is doing within that trade area. But really, you want to dive in for your business specifically and your trade area. Now, if you are a take it to them type of business, then then you have a a little bit larger of an area that you can technically do. Uh, However, you want to make sure that the extra jobs, the the distance to these jobs are worth the extra time and gas. Uh, If you can make thousands a pop, then yeah, 25 miles might make sense. But if your jobs are only $100 jobs, then the 25 mile radius probably is not the best thing for you. So you really want to research the trade area that you plan to get your customers and can they support your type of business and can you still be profitable with those businesses. Besides, it is much easier to dominate a small, a smaller market place than a larger one. So if you have a business that allows you to crush it and stay close to home, go for it. Uh, I'd much rather see you be the number one business in your own backyard. Uh, you're going to be much more successful that way uh, because you can just really make a, a name for yourself and a brand for yourself. We're going to talk more about that in future episodes. So uh, just make sure... Bottom line, do your research on your trade area. 
Uh, let's talk about some special requirements of your business, such as training and certifications. And since each business is slightly different, uh, some of your businesses will require you to have some special certifications or special training. Uh, sometimes this will be directed by the state, the county, or the city, and sometimes by the profession itself. Uh, for example, in some areas, dog groomers need certain uh, training in hours requirements uh, to be out in the field. In other areas, they don't require anything. Uh, I, now, don't get me wrong. I do recommend that you have some type of experience in whatever job you're going to be or whatever business you're going to be starting, but you don't have to. But the biggest thing is you need to make sure that you're meeting all the requirements uh, necessary. And the best way to check areas for this are any government websites, as well as going down to the county courthouses and stuff like that. But the good thing is there's a lot with the, with the internet and Google. There's a lot of government uh, websites out there. Cities, counties, states all have did certain. Plus, uh, depending upon the profession that you plan, the business you plan on opening, there usually are some uh, professional websites and associations for them that you can gather a lot of information. In most cases, there are some accredited certification people that are out there that will pop up when you Google things. Uh, just make sure you're careful of doing it and do the research. Don't get sucked in by someone saying you have to have something when you really don't. Obviously, they're in the business of selling schooling, so they're going to want you to join. Uh, not saying that you're not going to gain a lot from that. You probably are but uh, you want to find out, is it definitely needed or is it a nice to have? Is it a must have or is it a nice to have? And like I said, Google is a great place for you to be able to type in this type of stuff. Speak to others that are currently doing the business. Ask them what they had to do to be able to get their business open. Uh, you know, in most cases, they're going to be willing to share what they did. You don't necessarily have to tell them that you're going to be opening up one, but just say, hey, and then what, what did it um, when you opened up this business? Was it easy to do? Was it not? Uh, in some cases, go to another town, just tell them, hey, you're thinking about opening up one in, uh, you know, 20 miles away or whatever, you won't feel as much of a threat. And they're more likely to share what they had to do. So you just want to make sure that you have a lot in common as far as your area. So that way they're giving you uh, the right stuff for your particular area. Uh, a great example of this, for example, I have a friend who is thinking of becoming a home inspector. So I got him hooked up with a few of the local home inspectors here in town to get more information, uh, as well as he was doing all of his research through Google and the schools that he needs to have. And he did his research calling those different places. I hope, And then I really encouraged him to talk to some other home inspectors here locally to get more information on the shadowing part, as well as uh, their business here in town. So he has been doing research all week uh, on the needs, the costs associated with the transition. And uh, just yesterday, he told, for example, actually moving forward. So I'm excited for him. So just, just do the research and uh, talk to people. Biggest thing, talk to others doing it. You want to make sure that you know all the special requirements. Uh, for example, with my friend, he had to not only have the certification, but he also discovered how many hours he had to shadow. Your next stop is going to be City Hall, the county offices, state website, stuff like that. You will want to make sure that you have the right license uh, to have a business uh, not all businesses, but for the most part, most businesses, most cities are going to require you to have a city license. Uh, you're going to want to make sure exactly what it is that your city requires for how much, what type of businesses. Some don't need them, some do. Uh, each area is going to be completely different. This isn't necessarily a federal uh, type of thing. It really boils down to each of those different uh, city, county, and state. So make sure that you do that. You want to check with all of them. Don't just assume one. You want to check to all of them on any specific licensing that you are going to need. Um, plus, you're going to hear me bring up the city, state, and uh, county offices quite a bit in this section because they are going to be a host of questions that you're going to want to ask them uh, because they're going to be your main point of reference. So while you're checking on your licensing, you also want to make sure that you ask them about any taxes you are going to need to collect at the time of your services. Uh, brick and mortars will more than likely have sales taxes, for example. However, you, you don't want to assume, especially if you're in any kind of resaling. Sometimes there are some differences. Some of you don't have city and state taxes, so you want to check that, but don't assume once again. Uh, and when it comes to a service-based business, a lot of places don't necessarily have you tax people, but you don't want to assume that, so you want to make sure that you ask that question. 
Plus, as I mentioned, there's different types of taxes to be collected. So you'll want to make sure that you know exactly what your state and the local government, as well as the federal government, will be expecting from you each year when you pay your taxes. So if it's something that you are supposed to uh, get from the customers and clients up front, you want to make sure that you don't skip this part uh, because it's very difficult to get caught up on tax problems, uh, especially if you fall behind on your taxes. We'll talk about that more in future episodes. So uh, going to jail over taxes and not collecting from other people isn't worth it. So please make sure you do your homework when it comes to taxes. Another area that these government websites will be a great help for you will be uh, any permits that you might need. Uh, sometimes a permit is needed. It could be for your building or a permit for you to be able to work out of your vehicle. Some businesses require permits to set up shop on the street. For example, if you want to do a snow cone business in a parking space, a lot of times you'll need a permit from your city. I've even heard of some folks needing a permit to use uh, water as part of their business. Uh, for example, a hair salon or a, a dog groomer, stuff like that. I've heard some cases where they've needed permits to, to run that type of business. Uh, don't forget, you definitely will need permits. If you have food involved in your business, you will definitely be required to have certain certifications and permits if you serve the public in any way. So definitely do your homework there. Uh, so, you know, like I said, when you're talking to the city, county, and the state, uh, not to mention anything federally, you want to make sure that you're asking them about licensing, permits, taxes, uh, insurance, bonding, all this stuff. We've got a couple more coming up, but you, you want to talk to them about everything. Uh, speaking of insurance, uh, you want to make sure that you look at the type of insurance you need for your business. For the most part, everybody's going to need general insurance uh, for coverage uh, with some type of liability, especially if you are going out working in people's homes. Uh, you want something there to back you up to cover you just in case. Not that you're ever going to do anything, but you never know what might happen. So you want to have that. Uh, brick and mortar businesses, you're going to have a, probably a higher general liability because you're going to have to not only for your for your store level, but you're going to be required to have it as part of your lease. Uh, and if you're a franchise, they're going to have an amount. You'll want to check all of those things because they're going to require specific amounts that you're going to need as part of your business. So do your homework as far as how much you need to have and then also what it's going to cost you. Check out a lot of different insurance companies. Uh, sometimes your own insurance company might give you a discount because uh, they, you know, they love to bundle. And if you plan to have employees, you'll definitely have other types of insurances as well as workers comp and a bunch of other stuff. Later, we'll talk about employees. But for right now, you just want to make sure in general, you're checking out all the different types of insurance uh, and coverages that you are going to need for this business. And just, you know, er, er, I mentioned bonding earlier. Uh, sometimes it might be an industry standard for whatever business you're going to be doing then you're going to want to make sure you look into that and find out uh, if it's A, required, and B, if it's not required, will you be able to charge more if you have it? So make sure you do your homework. Um, there are some uh, businesses that do require it. You know, and, and by the way, as far as licensing and bonding, some businesses you can still run without those things and other times you have to have them. But uh, in some cases, it may not make sense either. For example, if something costs you $10,000 to get a specific license a year, but you're nowhere near going to do that type of business, but and you can still do your business without it, then you're going to have to weigh out the pros and cons of both. One more thing real quick while I'm thinking about it that goes to the city, state, county is any zoning laws or, or other regulations that you are going to want to make sure that you follow. Uh, you'll want to check with those uh, those places. Uh, sometimes a business has to be located within certain zoning. Uh, so if you're planning to run your business out of your home, you need to make sure that you are zoned to do so. It, it might say that it's a residential, but sometimes the uh, county will say that, yeah, you can run your business out of that home. And if you're going to rent a home and just run a business period out of it, and it's not going to be where you're living, a lot of times they have to be zoned certain ways. So make sure you do your homework there as well whether you're a brick and mortar or running out of your vehicle, just, just make sure you do the homework. All right. If you are going to be a brick and mortar business, there is a whole nother set of research that you need to do. 
I'm not going to go over everything under the sun, but I want to make sure that you know that you, you need to dive in and do your research uh, if you plan on opening up a brick and mortar business. In addition to the items we covered earlier, there are tons of costs and needs for leasing out space. You want to check, uh, like I said, you want to make sure you have the right location first and foremost. And two, you need to uh, dive into what it's going to cost you on that business to rent out the space, but also how much it's going to cost you to build it out. Uh, you know, it, it, believe it or not, you get an empty shell when you take over these businesses. So you're going to have to buy all the equipment to go inside. You're going to have to do the construction. You're going to have to put it together. There's a lot of costs that come along with opening up a brick and mortar. It's it's not like a turnkey where you open up the door and boom, there's your business already set. In some cases, you have to, to uh, build